And I'd love to uh, bring onto the stage and introduce uh, Kevin Gessner from Etsy. Uh, lessons from our first 100,000 basil builds. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Kevin. There you go. What do I click? All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for being here. My name is Kevin Gessner, and I'm an engineer on the Search Platform team at Etsy. Uh, Search is a big deal for Etsy, and there's really no better place to buy custom slime or cat hats online. Uh, my team is responsible for designing, building, and operating the few dozen systems that power the various Etsy Search features. There's a lot of complexity that makes a page like that work, so let's take a little peek behind the curtain. Yep. That seems about right. Over the past few years, we've invested heavily in making the developer experience of working on our search mono repo smooth and easy for our engineers. That hard work has paid off. Today, an Etsy engineer can build, configure, and deploy a multi-language, multi-service suite of applications with one command. I'm here, of course, because that command is Bazel Run. It's been a substantial process over the past three years to get to this point, but hundreds of builds, builds a day with just a few dozen engineers show that it's been worth it. Since our initial experiments in 2016, Bazel has piece by piece and language by language come to consume more and more of our build pipeline. Going all in on Bazel might be a good fit for you too. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the choices we've faced, the mistakes we've made, and the lessons we've learned as the very hungry build system has come to consume our entire development process. Thank you to Eric Carl for the art, and apologies to children's book lovers everywhere. Uh, in addition to some of the big picture ideas and concepts that we've adopted with Bazel, I'll have some links and code snippets throughout the talk. Uh, I'll make sure I share a link at the end of these slides so you don't have to worry about transcribing them as we go. But I'll start with the biggest lesson we've learned, the one that has really driven our adoption of Bazel and pushed us through tens of thousands of Bazel builds. Believe the hype. If any of you are Gradle or Ant or SPT users, I'm sure you've gotten really good at running clean and then build, because despite your best effort, your build and your tests are flaky. I've been there, and I can say that with Bazel, that has largely become a thing of the past. When they say fast, correct, choose to, they mean it. But I'm not saying everything is sunshine and daisies. With apologies to the Bazel team, I'm going to stick a big asterisk on believe, and for good measure, one on hype, too. And later on in the talk, I will share much more about the rougher edges that we've run up against. But now let's come back to our little newborn Bazel workspace. In late 2016, fed up with our flaky and slow build combining Gradle, SBT, and a ton of shell scripts, my teammate Greg Donovan proposed that we switch to Bazel. At the time, Bazel was still quite new. I think we started on version 0.4, about three dozen Bazel releases ago. To get started, Greg set up a Bazel build in parallel with our Gradle build for one of our smaller, simpler Java applications. And even though it was just a handful of packages, it started to give us a good feel for what the full migration would look like. And really, we liked what we saw. Writing build files was fairly straightforward, and we started to get a taste of Starlark, the language for Bazel build files and custom extensions. Full builds, incremental builds, and tests were all fast, as promised. Starting small was a good idea because it gave us time to learn the ropes and figure out best practices before we created hundreds of build files for the whole repo. We decided that Bazel was the way forward and started to migrate the rest of our Java build, again in parallel with the existing Gradle build. What had started small as a few packages was now going to build a couple thousand source files. And as we worked on migrating all this code, we faced a big problem, dependencies. In fact, it was two separate problems, which you've already heard about from other people today how to handle external dependencies, and how to deal with the internal dependencies in our code base. Any application of a reasonable size is going to have external dependencies, and unless you work at Google, you're going to download them from the internet at build time. To avoid all kinds of bugs, it's important that you get the right version of each library you depend on, and the libraries that they depend on, and on and on. For a quick example, let's say your application depends on gRPC and the solar search engine. Each of those depends on some things, which may overlap, so you'd better hope there is a common com compatible version that will work. And then those have dependencies. All these transitive dependencies, the dependencies of your dependencies, are important. Bazel needs to know about them, both for compile time and then to run our build artifacts. When we started with Bazel, the recommended way of managing these artifacts was do it yourself. There was a script called Migrate Workspace that could import our Gradle build into Bazel once, but after that, it was on us to keep all these dependencies upgraded and in sync. 
a graph like this, but literally hundreds of dependencies with complex interdependencies and versioning. This was effectively impossible to do by hand. We ended up with missing dependencies, version mismatches, and all kinds of runtime failures. We needed another solution, and the Bazel community came to the rescue. We adopted a tool written by Oscar Boykin and some folks at Stripe called Bazel Depths. Instead of leaving us to manage the full tree of dependencies ourselves, we simply tell Bazel Depths the fewer top-level dependencies that we directly need. Then it uses this declaration to generate a set of build files representing those and all their transitive dependencies. When we upgrade or add a dependency, we just rerun Bazel Depths and it updates all the files. This has worked really well for us as our repository has grown because we haven't had to worry about all the transitive dependencies under the hood. Bazel Depths takes care of it. This pattern of managing transitive dependencies with tooling works for other languages too, so we'll see it again. And it's not without drawbacks. Because Bazel Depths is a separate tool that generates code that is checked into our repository, we have to make sure that those generated files are up to date. So we wrote a test in our CI system that generates them and makes sure everything's in sync. More recently, there's a new tool called Rules JVM External that handles Maven dependencies right in the Bazel build, so no generated files and they can't get out of sync, which seems like a nice improvement. So thanks to Bazel Depths, that's external dependencies sorted. Internal dependencies posed a different set of problems. Our Gradle configuration for building Java was largely monolithic. Each application would be compiled as a single unit containing sometimes hundreds of source files. Each time we ran a build, Java C would be run with all those files, producing a single jar. This is an easy approach to set up and maintain. You tell Gradle to build the entire directory tree, and it takes care of the rest. As we were learning about Bazel, it was really tempting to replicate the setup we had with Gradle and have Bazel build large targets too. But like the folks at Wix, we picked up a rule of thumb called the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one rule. It only gets about one line in the Bazel docs, but I think it's really important enough to reiterate. Quote, we recommend authoring a build file per directory and defining a dependency graph between them. That is, each source directory becomes one package with its own build file. They call this idea target granularity in the docs, how many source files should be included in each build target. Creating one build file per directory does mean that your build is quite a bit more work to set up, but trust me, it's very much worth the effort to set up your build with small packages. Imagine as an example a small tree like this, you can either create one target at the top level, covering all the files recursively, or for each of the packages one, two, and three, create their own target connected by, inter by dependencies. You have to be explicit with Bazel about what those dependencies are. For instance, here, where package three depends on package one and package two, but which are independent of each other. If you have many small targets, your builds will be much faster. That's true both for full builds, because the packages can be built in parallel, and for incremental builds, because what needs to be compiled is much smaller for any given change. And getting to small packages with explicit dependencies may be a challenge if you already have a large existing monorepo. There are some automated tools like Exodus that can do this for you, but we also found that they have limitations. So if you have a large code base with lots of internal dependencies, expect quite a bit of work. One additional wrinkle beyond just resolving the dependencies is dealing with circular imports. Because Bazel models your build as an acyclic graph, a graph without loops, you can't have packages with a circular dependency on one another. A monolithic build doesn't care because everything is compiled at once, but Bazel needs to know what to compile first. It turned out that our code base had many circular dependencies on our own packages. As part of the Bazel migration, we shipped a massive refactoring that moved classes and packages around to remove those loops. Learn from our mistakes and don't do it this way. If I was doing this again, I would ship this as a much smaller set of changes so that I wouldn't introduce a bunch of bugs. Otherwise, you'll find yourself like we did, reverting and trying again, and reverting again, and trying again, until you finally get it right. But we got it right eventually, and after defeating the two-headed monster of Java dependencies and constructing a couple hundred build files, we were ready to say goodbye to Gradle. At this point, a change that we had made months earlier when we first started considering switching build systems really paid off. When we decided that we'd migrate to Bazel, we knew we wanted to make it painless for our users, the engineers at Etsy that work on search. So we wrote two very simple wrapper scripts, build.sh and runtest.sh. At first, these scripts simply called out to Gradle, running the well-known commands to build our apps and to run the tests, after cleaning the build, of course. We updated our CI and all our docs to reference the new scripts, 
and encourage people to start using them immediately instead of calling Gradle directly. Then by the time we were ready to swap Bazel in for all our builds, no one had to remember new commands. We just updated the guts of the wrapper scripts to call Bazel instead. We didn't have to call Bazel clean this time, which is nice. This made the transition much less painful, and I can't recommend it enough. So these scripts, along with the Bazel RC file, also give us a place to set common standards and common configuration, which creates a more consistent experience for our users. The test wrapper, for instance, runs a quick query in grep to ensure that every Java test file is included in a Java test target. Otherwise, those tests won't be run because Bazel doesn't automatically discover tests. This has definitely caught its share of build problems before they were merged, and the, the source for this script is linked in the notes. Having a checked in .bazelrc file allows us to set Bazel flags globally, automatically applying them to all builds of our repository. Those flags let us control a variety of Bazel features, but most importantly, they let us decide when we adopt breaking changes. Because Bazel rolls out major changes over several versions, there are flags to, so you can choose exactly when you adopt new behavior. And you will need to update around breaking changes. While Bazel is very good about backwards compatibility, the project moves very fast. So for the best experience, I also recommend adding a Bazel version file that specifies the exact version of Bazel that your project works, works with. Then you can use a launcher, like John mentioned, like Bazelisk, that will read that file and automatically fetch the right version of Bazel, so you don't have to install it or update it yourselves. If you're into the belt and suspenders approach, you can also specify a minimum supported version right in your workspace. Altogether, sharing these Bazel configs will make your experience and your team's experience much nicer. But of course, even with all these wrapper scripts, our engineers could tell that the tooling had changed. And while there was a bit of adjusting, people were generally impressed with the switch from Gradle. In particular, builds and tests immediately got faster, which was a significant quality of life improvement for our developers. This speed up is largely thanks to Bazel's caching, which is the core feature behind the fast part of fast and correct. Because we created small targets with explicit dependencies, Bazel can confidently know what needs to be rebuilt after we make changes, and use a cached artifact if nothing has changed. So instead of every build with Gradle taking long enough for a coffee break, incremental builds suddenly take under a minute and just a few seconds in many cases. You can even use a shared remote cache, so Bazel will simply download a matching compiled artifact instead of building it if anyone has built that version of your code before. In practice, our remote cache gets us a hit rate around 95% for production builds and tests, but it took a lot of tuning and a lot of adjusting to get it there. There are some pretty good logs and cache debugging tools, and I think George from Uber uh, is speaking about caching and remote execution and all of the things that go into that tomorrow, which I'm really looking forward to. I think the coolest part is that Bazel doesn't just cache jars and binaries, the kind of artifacts you're used to. It also caches test results. And test result caching is one of the best selling points for Bazel. It's just such a clear benefit compared to other build systems. As you're making code changes, you no longer have to worry about finding the right test that covers the code you're working on or suffer waiting for the entire test suite. You just ask Bazel to run all the tests, and it will only rerun those that it knows have, are affected by your changes. The others will instantly report the last cache result. I think it feels like magic, and you get it right out of the box with Bazel. So with that, our very hungry build system has gobbled up Java, but it's still hungry. What's next? Also in 2017, while we were migrating to Bazel, we started the process of replatforming all the search services. We were moving from a fleet of several hundred bare metal servers to Kubernetes. Here's your 15 second Kubernetes lesson. You build your binaries into Docker images, then configure them with YAML manifests that define the applications, load balancers, storage, and all the rest that they need to run. Kubernetes uses those definitions to download the Docker images for your applications, then configures and starts the containers. There is a lot more to Kubernetes, but given that this is BazelCon, not KubeCon, that should be enough to talk about how we use Bazel with Kubernetes. I'll speak more about the YAML side of things later, but the first hurdle we needed to tackle for this migration was building Docker images around our binaries. At first, we would use Bazel to build an artifact, then a Docker file to build it into an image. But pretty quickly, we adopted rules Docker to build the images directly with Bazel. Replacing a Docker file with rules Docker is pretty straightforward. You use the container image rule, you specify the base image you want to build on and whatever files and packages you want to copy in, and you're set. When you build this target, rules Docker produces an archive of the image, like a Docker file does, but it also builds a shell script, which makes working with the image easy. When you run the script, it loads the built image into Docker. That is, when you run Bazel build my Docker image, it builds the image, 
and Bazel Run, my Docker image, not only builds it, but loads it into your local Docker for easy testing. I've come to really like these handy hooks and scripts that a lot of Bazel rules produce, and it all comes from Bazel's ability to easily build multiple kinds of artifacts from the same sources. A big reason we chose Bazel was because of its promises of reproducibility. The idea that if I build a certain set of source files and you build them, we will get the same result. And not just a program that produces the same output, but bit for bit the same artifacts on disk. And it is much harder than you'd think to get Java C or GCC to produce the exact same output twice in a row, let alone on separate machines. It requires these hermetic sandboxes where Bazel tracks not only the source files, but the environment and the compilers and everything else. By controlling that entire environment, unexpected things can't sneak in, like timestamps or sources of randomness. This also enables the caching that makes builds so fast. Uh, the Bazel and Blaze teams have done really amazing work to make this all work, uh, and it, it, it really pays off. I think we've hit one Java reproducibility bug in all our time with Bazel, so really, this is a place where you can believe the hype. Reproducibility is really key for Docker images, because even outside of Bazel, images are identified by a hash of their contents. If you change a single bit in the image, it changes its whole identity, and any container that's running that image has no choice but to restart with the changes. With images easily weighing hundreds of megs, it was important for our network and for our deploy speed that we not change images' identities unless they'd really changed. With Bazel building both the images and the binaries inside them reproducibly, we can trust that the image IDs only change when the code inside them meaningfully changes. Coming back to our images, our code needs a strong foundation to run successfully in a Docker image. So we build our images on top of pre-built base images containing our major dependencies, like the JVM, libc, and Python. We get these images from Google's DistroList project, which produces very small Docker images for exactly this purpose, serving as a foundation to build your images on. There are distroless based images for a bunch of popular runtimes, and they really do serve a great foundation. But they're called distroless for a reason. While they're built on top of Debian, they don't include any of the usual things you see in Linux. All you get is the runtime, not a shell, not cat, not ls, not vim. It keeps the images small, and our security team loves it, because software that isn't in our image can't have a vulnerability. But we do need some of these tools in our images. We run shell scripts that power important production tasks, and they need basic utilities like rsync and curl and jq. These aren't uncommon, but distrolist by design includes nothing. But distrolist does include a Bazel library called Package Manager, which lets you download and install packages from the Debian repositories. This gives you access to the whole world of Debian packages, which is essentially all software under the sun. But it doesn't take away any of the hermeticity or reproducibility because every package is pinned to a specific version and hash. So we choose exactly which tools we want in our images, and we can repeatedly build our own little Linux distro that contains exactly what we need. It's a bit more work than building on top of a full-featured uh, image like Ubuntu, but it pays off in smaller images and better caching. And we get that caching throughout the stack. The jars, the packages, and the layers of images are all seamlessly handled as one build and built as one target. And while you're looking at DistroList, I recommend taking a glance at some of the other utilities in the Google Container Tools GitHub project. Uh, some of them are very handy, like Container Structure Test. It's integrated into Rules Docker. It lets you write full end-to-end -end tests of your images, which are run and the results cached alongside all your other Bazel tests. So now our Bazel build has consumed our Java images, and it turns its hungry eyes towards the rest of our stack. First on the menu is Scala, and thanks to the wonderful folks at Stripe and Wix and several other Scala shops for the beautiful open source rules Scala. It was so easy to replace our SBT build, which was a maintenance nightmare inside our mono repo, with Bazel Scala targets. And because the Scala rules were all part of the same build, we could drop those artifacts into Docker images. Suddenly, we have a multi-language build with fewer tools than we were using before. Next, our build gobbled up Go using rules Go. And at the beginning, we had some growing pains with importing external dependencies into our build, like we'd faced with Java. But in the years since, the Gazelle tool and the modules features that have been added to Go itself have really improved that situation. We manage dependencies in Go like we do with Java. Oh, what's going on here? Can we go back a couple slides? Couple more back, please. We'll get started. Thank you. <laughs> I was I was wrapped with the story, so <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess our, our this slide is really was great. too. There we go. Thank you. 
Where were we? Right, so we're managing dependencies in Go, like we do with Java, by specifying the top level ones and uh, letting tooling take care of the rest, getting in the transitive dependencies. We've also had some struggles building native C Go packages. Uh, those depend on the GCC and headers that you have installed locally, so you don't get the nice hermetic build and compiler like you do when you're building pure Go code. But generally, it's been really smooth, and Go and Scala really feel like first-class Bazel citizens. Uh, along the way, our build also picked up some JavaScript with rules Node.js. With all these rules, I think it's been really exciting to watch Bazel itself and the rules evolve in tandem. The Bazel contributors improve the Starlark APIs based on what the rules need, and the rules innovate up to the edges and sometimes even past the edges of what Starlark is able to do. It's really worth keeping up to date with both Bazel itself and the rules so that you pick up all these features and improvements in speed, reliability, and build safety. I think the biggest takeaway here is that the Bazel community is amazing. You should absolutely be using third-party rules in your build whenever you can. Jin Chen from the Bazel team maintains a list of rules called Awesome Bazel, and I think you'll find rules for whatever languages or platforms you use, from Swift to CSS to Ruby to OCaml. These exist thanks to the hard work of Googlers and the wider Bazel community, which is to say, us. And while this community is great, I know it can be even better. We've only begun to explore what a build system like Bazel can do by bringing together multiple technologies, and as more people and communities join in, I'm sure we'll see new innovations and new ideas. This is especially true if we make sure there is a wide variety of perspectives and backgrounds in the Bazel community. Those of us here, and especially those of us on this stage that look more like me, aren't representative of the wider tech community. We have the opportunity to be allies and sponsors so that BaselCon 2020 showcases more viewpoints from the even more amazing and diverse community that I know we can become. So with four languages under its belt, our hungry Bazel build has consumed a huge part of our build and deploy pipeline. Looking back at this high-level picture of our Kubernetes deploys, Bazel is now building all the Docker images. And that's great, but our build is still hungry and it has its eyes on that YAML. Remember, these YAML files tell Kubernetes where and how to run our applications. So they contain a lot of boilerplate, but also a lot of configuration that is specific to each application and each environment. And as we added more applications and more environments, wrangling so many handwritten YAML files was getting completely unmaintainable. Remember, these are the core configuration for our production systems, and they were growing to be hundreds or even thousands of handwritten lines. Different applications often had very similar sections, but there was no way to share code between them and keep them consistent. So we did what any self-respecting group of software engineers would do. We added Python to it. Instead of maintaining all this YAML by hand, we'll write Python scripts to generate the YAML. That'll give us all the benefits of a real programming language to reduce duplication, add tests, and make things configurable. So our Bazel build sinks its teeth into Python. Bazel ships with rules for Python that are just like the others, so getting a simple script up and running is straightforward. And since anything can be an output in Bazel, we wrote a small Starlark rule that takes our YAML writing Python binary and puts the output into a file. Now the YAML files are built and cached with Bazel along with the rest of our outputs. It's much better than handwriting all this code. However, we still need different YAML files for different environments, like dev, QA, and prod. If you were at BaselCon last year, you heard my teammate Greg talk about some of the struggles that we've had to get the right configuration into the right places. At the time, we were using workspace status variables, a little documented way of injecting outside state into your Bazel build. For us, that meant a variety of environment variables, which our deploy scripts had to carefully set up before calling Bazel. And that served us only OK. Injecting environment variables means that Bazel can't cache as much, because any time any of the variables changes, anything that might have depended on them has to be invalidated and rebuilt. That made our, made our build slow and brittle, because if you didn't set up the environment just right, who knows what you'd get. I'll talk a bit later about how we moved away from the workspace status file, but for now I'll just say we learned the hard way that it should be a tool of last resort. So now that our build has gobbled up its first Python, and these scripts to generate YAML, these are pretty simple, mostly pure Python with few dependencies. And since that seemed to be going great, we decided to move some of our other Python scripts into Bazel. And as you've already heard today, uh, this is where things start to get a little hairy. We depend on Python pretty heavily beyond just generating YAML for Kubernetes. It's a great language for tooling and for automation, as well as for small services. So it's important to us to have a good Python story in our build. And until very recently, we were entirely using Python 2 because we're lazy. 
Luckily, that laziness was a good thing because Bazel didn't support Python 3 at the time. It does now, though it's still a little sketchy to wrangle both versions. And with both Python 2 and 3, we unfortunately don't get all of the great Bazel features that we've come to love and seen in other languages. In particular, the hermetic sandbox builds and tests don't work as well with Python as with other languages. By default, any Python script that you run with Bazel will use your system's Python, which might be a decade-old Python 2.6 or a bleeding-edge Python 3.8. With most compiled languages, Bazel tool chains let you specify more or less precisely the exact compiler versions and tool versions you're going to get, but Python doesn't have such support out of the box. Your system Python likely has some number of libraries installed globally as well, and since Bazel runs that Python, your code will be able to import those libraries until you take that code to another machine where those libraries aren't available. This has caused us a lot of trouble. The lack of hermeticity in Python is probably the single biggest frustration that we have with Bazel, and it feels really limiting compared to the great clean support that we've gotten for Java and Scala and Go. We use rules Python to add dependencies with pip, and we try really hard to keep our CI system clean so we'll know if we end up with undeclared dependencies from the system. And like with Java and Go, we check in a list of every dependency pinned to a specific version to avoid surprises. But it adds a lot of manual work and unexpected failures. It's really great to know that there are so many people around the conference working on and thinking about Python, uh, because I know that Bazel's Python support is only going to get better from here. So in early 2018, this is where we were. Our very hungry build system has chomped its way through half a dozen languages and technologies, building jars, binaries, scripts, Docker images, and YAML, and running hundreds of tests. So the final snack our Bazel build has lined up is our deploy pipeline. When I've showed you this slide before, I've actually left out a very important piece, the giant pile of handwritten bash scripts that deploy what we've built to Kubernetes. These scripts would call Bazel to build the Docker images, then tag and push them, then call Bazel again to build the YAML, and finally deploy that to Kubernetes. And again, because again, we're lazy, we would copied that script to each application and made little changes to it for each, that were specific to each app. It was up to the engineer who was deploying to know which scripts needed to be called to deploy the right applications to the right environment and to set the right environment variables to produce the correct YAML. It was a huge mess and a huge source of bugs. But at BaselCon in 2017, Matt from Google and Miles from Databricks demoed something that we knew right away we wanted to use, rules Kates. This is a set of Bazel rules that would replace our hand-rolled deploy scripts and allow us to scale the number and complexity of apps we deploy. The main magic of rules Kates is the Kates object rule. This rule replaces our complicated shell script with some clear and readable Bazel targets. I want to go into some detail here because I think that the way that we use rules Kates and the way that it works internally really captures a lot of the lessons that we've learned uh, about using Bazel effectively. So before rules Kates, we had a handwritten shell script that deployed Bazel built Docker images with Bazel built YAML files. We've replaced that with a Kates object target, which builds a shell script that deploys images and YAML uh, files when we Bazel run it. And you might hear that and wonder, didn't we just replace one shell script with a fancier one? And you'd be right if we'd stopped there. By switching to rules Kates instead of our own script, we get a bunch of additional benefits and opportunities to improve our deploy pipeline further. First, like with all the other open source rules that I've been talking about, we now get to build on the work of the Bazel community. To me, replacing code that we have to maintain ourselves with open source is almost always an improvement. It's one less thing for us to worry about and many more people to improve it. Second, the scripts produced by Rules Kates don't depend on any of your local executables, like kubectl or Docker. And that's an immediate win for hermetic builds, which we've seen time and time again are a benefit, so we can worry less about the vagaries of each individual dev environment. The tools that it does need are downloaded via the workspace, pinned to specific versions that we know work. Third, Rules Kates automatically handles versioning our Docker images. In the YAML we upload to Kubernetes, we tell it which version of each image it should run. Kate's object, as part of the build, processes the images and the YAML together, specifying each image with its precise hash ID, the same identity we were talking about when we were talking about reproducibility. We don't have to worry about manually tagging our images or updating the YAML ourselves. Rules Kates produces a built, resolved YAML file with the image hash embedded in the rest of the manifest that we wrote and a purpose-built shell script to deploy it called apply.sh. Using that consistent image hash means that Kubernetes only has to restart containers when the image's identity has changed, not on every deploy. This makes our deploys faster and smoother. 
I also find it really exciting that Bazel's promises of reproducibility and consistent builds aren't just for build speed or for caching. They actually enable new ways of thinking about and deploying your software like this. So here's where we are. We have artifacts from multiple languages built into Docker images and deployed to Kubernetes, all with Bazel. This diagram is admittedly a simplification, and it's just one of the numerous applications we deploy. And I did say earlier that we can deploy an entire environment of multiple applications, all with one Bazel command. This isn't quite there. Plus, we still have that pesky reliance on environment variables, which is making our build brittle. Earlier this year, we solved both of those problems in one go. Our Bazel build now understands the environments we deploy to, including which apps are deployed where, and what configuration they need for each specific environment. We call these configurations deployment contexts. They remove the need for environment variables and enable us to have a single deploy command for each environment, just like I promised. We have Bazel feed that context into our existing Python, generating the correct YAML for each environment with no other inputs required. We implemented this by taking all the configuration that had been passed as environment variables and rewriting it as Starlark constants. That is, we statically define each of our applications and each of our environments and how each application should be configured for that environment. Because we're deploying to Kubernetes, our contexts are things like cluster names, namespaces, auth information, and such. Depending on your specific systems, you might need something different. This is all implemented in Starlark, so Bazel is fully aware of it. And this only works because Starlark is an expressive and powerful language. So we can define these contexts in a human-readable way and let Bazel generate targets at build time to do the work. It's all neatly wrapped up in Bazel rules and macros, so engineers don't have to think too much about the details. For instance, in this app, we tie together the YAML building Python with two contexts, one for QA and one for prod, with different configuration for each environment. Instead of a single YAML file being produced and a single Kates object to deploy it, we have Bazel create a YAML file and deploy script for each context with a unique name and it contains and deploys the customized manifest for that environment. That means that we can configure, inspect, and build each application in each environment in isolation and understand exactly what will be deployed where and when. And without environment variables in our build, each of these targets is cached individually and easily rebuilt, so our build is faster as well as easier to use and understand. It all comes together like this for an application with a context, YAML, and deploy script per environment but with all of that app's context using the same images. We're not the only people exploring using Starlark configuration for deploy environments. Uh, check out the SkyConfig project from Stripe and Isopod from Cruise, uh, which are taking the same idea in different directions. And those are linked in the notes. As a bonus, once we've gotten our custom rules wrapping our contexts, we can do even more with build time target generation. We take each generated YAML file, one per application per context, and generate a corresponding test target. That test reads the YAML and validates it, making sure we didn't produce something that would fail at deploy time. The engineer doesn't have to do anything to get this test for their application. And in fact, they can't not get the test. Using Bazel macros and tests to enforce good behavior has worked well for us, moving more validation up front with seamless automation. We use the same pattern to enforce code formatting with Bazel tests and to set certain compiler warnings automatically at every step of our build. Now, I'd promised you single command deploys, and here we are. With the context defining which applications are deployed to each environment, Bazel can finally generate a single command for each environment, wrapping up all the deploy scripts for all of that environment's applications. So this single Bazel run command will do everything to get a number of applications stood up in our QA environment. It will build binaries from several languages, make them into Docker images, generate configured YAML, create a number of context-specific scripts, then run them to deploy it all to Kubernetes, all in about two minutes. It's easy as pie. Well, there is actually a lot more complexity in reality. This is the uh, real build graph for that command in our repository. I couldn't even get it to lay out right. It's a, a pretty tangled ball of yarn. But don't fear. Bazel enables us to build such a complex and powerful pipeline from small parts that are simpler to understand. And that's due to the power of Starlark. This wasn't the first Starlark I'd written for our build, but it was definitely the most complicated. I've learned over the past three years to not be afraid of extending Bazel. There are terrifying diagrams like this in the docs, but it's much easier than that to get started, so don't worry too much. Writing your own rules with Starlark will let you integrate your Bazel build with a whole variety of tools, both simple and complex. 
The learning curve for Starlark is steep. You have to get comfortable with thinking about your build as a series of discrete actions and steps and understand what rules can and cannot do, which can sometimes be surprising. Starting with gen rules is a great way to dip your toes in and get some experience before diving deeper. I think of gen rules as magic glue for sticking different parts of your build together, but doing it in a safe and repeatable way. It's worth learning to write macros and rules because Starlark gives you access to all the power of Bazel's sandboxing and reproducibility, plus the power of all the other tools in your toolbox. You'll be able to plug your logic into any step of the build, consume inputs created by other Bazel targets, and pass your outputs down to further build steps. Your Starlark code can mix seamlessly with both the built-in rules and third-party rules. With so much flexibility, anything you dream up producing, you can probably build with Bazel. There are libraries like Skylib that let you write tests for your rules, and there are plenty of open source rules out there to give you, plenty, to give you examples to look at. Once you write your first rule, I'm confident you're going to want to write more. I know I did, and so this is the part of the talk where I get to plug them. We use Grafana heavily at Etsy for dashboards and monitoring, but I like keeping my hands on my keyboard, so I find Grafana's UI for building dashboards to be a little clunky. So building on top of the Grafana, li Grafana lib library from Weaveworks, I wrote rules Grafana to make it easy to build Grafana dashboards with Bazel. You implement your graphs and such in Python, then use the rules to build them into a Docker image that runs the Grafana server. The dashboards are baked right into Grafana, just like you built them in the UI, but since they're defined in code, you can track them in Git and use all the power of Python and Bazel to build them consistently and share code. We've been using Rules Grafana at Etsy for about a year, and we've built dozens of dashboards. It's been pretty great, if I do say so myself. The rules are on GitHub, and I encourage you to check them out. So here we are today. Here we are today. There we go. Look how our Bazel build has grown. With our whole deploy pipeline in great shape and powered by a single Bazel run, we've come really far. Bazel has gobbled up a huge variety of languages, runtimes, tools, and systems, while we've reduced the number of build tools in our stack dramatically. In the process, we've stood on the shoulders of the Bazel community, gone deep with Starlark, and wowed our engineers with the speed of test caching. And while our very hungry build system wants to know what's on the menu next, our engineers know that we've built a fast, stable, and consistent platform that lets them do their work better. Going all in with Bazel isn't trivial, and we've learned our share of hard lessons along the way. But it does pay off. Etsy engineers deploy search apps with Bazel 50 to 100 times every day and run tens of thousands of tests. Our first 100,000 Bazel builds have been a smashing success, and I can't wait for the next million. Thank you all so much. The links to these slides and more notes is at bit.ly slash hungrybasil, and I'm happy to take your questions. There it is. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, we can have the mics in the middle. Yeah. That was a great talk, very comprehensive. Thank you. I actually uh, learned uh, a few things, and uh, it's good to hear. I got excited, yeah. Well, I'm new, new to, the, to the Basil team. It's so. good to get you excited. Yeah, fantastic. We've got one. Uh, is, this, is it Oscar? So. Hi, Kevin. It's Oscar. Oh, hi, uh, Oscar. <laughs> love to talk. I, I had no idea how comprehensive uh, you guys have a, quite a large multi-language setup. I just had one minor comment. Just FYI, you can generate the build uh, files as part of a build rule with uh, the tool that you're using. We, That's what I get do, for uh, not that. keeping up to date with my dependencies. Thank right. you, Oscar. So just, just the creator of Bazel Depths, everyone. <laughs> Any other questions? You're welcome to come find me later. I'll be here. I'll, oh, yes. So while you guys, oh, my name's Anthony. I work at uh, Twitter. Hi, Anthony. Um, so while you guys were first evaluating uh, Basil to use at Etsy, did you guys consider other tools like, like Pants or Buck or just kind of curious like, we did, yeah. Bazel was pretty new, as I said, uh, newly released, but it's not a new project because I think it's been used at Google for like 30 years or something. Um, we did look at Pants and Buck and we talked to some people from it's Twitter and Facebook or Facebook yes. and Twitter. Um, but really, we kind of decided that if we were going to go all in on a you know, new build system and one that's based around this declarative reproducible thing, we should go with the original one, uh, not with the knockoff. No offense. <laughs> no, no, totally makes sense. <laughs> Thanks so much. Sure thing. 
uh, Thanksgiving. That was a great talk. I'm Thanks. curious how widespread is the knowledge and the understanding of how all the rules interact together? Is it just kind of constrained to a few people? Not as widespread as we would like. Um, because we're a small team, we don't have a dedicated build engineering or deploy engineering team. I'm very jealous of the people who do. We really just have me and a couple other engineers part time. Uh, we think about the developer experience holistically, and sometimes that means working on the build. Um, so yeah, the, the knowledge of Starlark in particular is not as widespread as I would like. Knowledge of Bazel as a user is getting better and better. Uh, we wrote some docs specifically to the way that we set it up. Uh, we also have a Bazel channel in our company Slack and some Bazel custom emojis, which have really gotten us far in terms of uh, supporting people as they use Bazel. But I will say as a rules author, I don't want my users to have to know a lot about how it works under the hood, but certainly some other people on my team should for maintainability. Hello. You're up. Oh, that's me. Uh, great. So we use Python 2, uh, well, Python 2 and a 3 now. And one problem that we have are tens of thousands of symlinks produced by the, the Python rules. How do you all handle that? We don't. We just let it happen. OK, yeah. same. There, is, there are admittedly a lot of things where I am uh, waiting with bated breath for GitHub issues to be fixed in Bazel itself. Uh, there are a lot of issues, particularly in Python. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a waiting game for us. Again, because we don't have dedicated build engineers, we, can't, we have to pick and choose what, uh, what we do. I will say, we don't end up with tens of thousands of symlinks, so it's not a bottleneck, especially on Linux that we run. I suspect if we were running this on Mac OS or Windows, it would hurt more. Any other questions? Just checking to see if uh, John Field wants sure. to say well, anything I, I, about I'll Python say, in the remaining three yes, minutes we, you have here. We've heard these issues. Python has been challenging. Talk to me offline. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Punt. Yeah. No, I mean, to do, let's talk. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, everyone's welcome to come talk we, to me. We do have a Python Birds of a Feather session tomorrow Ooh, where the team's Python expert, who, uh, John Renvine, who could make it today, will be there to. Uh, remotely, so if you throw things at him, it will just bounce off the screen. Uh, but, but no, that's a good opportunity to get together. And you know, one issue is uh, defining priorities for work in the space. And I, I think that could be a good opportunity to do that. So that's the short answer. But do talk to us offline. We, we're aware of the, you know, the, the pain points. Okay. Thank you. OK. Hey, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Thank you all.